Hi, it's Frank here at thechampionsoccacademy.com where we help young football mad players to boost their confidence, accelerate their skills and improve their attitude so they can be happy and successful on and off the pitch. So today, this week, I thought uh, I'd introduce a good friend of mine, Nick Jones, who is a physical development specialist. Uh, so, you know, it's something that's very close to my heart because it's something that held me back in my own playing career when I was trying to make my way in the game. I'll, you know, I'm sure we'll get into that as, as the conversation develops with Nick. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Nick on the call today. And it's something that we've introduced pretty much since the beginning at the Champion Soccer Academy, physical development. So it's great to have a real expert on hand today to give us some tips, to give you some tips, parents, players, anybody supporting young players out there uh, to meet their full potential. So welcome, Nick, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, mate. Um, I'm sitting in sunny Manchester, so I'm going to hope the technology will stay with us and the internet connection will call out so we can have a, a good conversation, mate. Yeah, so um, I started off my career as a proper footballer, mate. Um, so I was a goalkeeper, a mental goalkeeper. Um, and I used to play for, um, well, I'm from Wrexham in North Wales. So I played for Wrexham schools. And I'm sorry to tell your audience down in South Wales, mate, we were the Welsh champions year upon year upon year. So we came down and beat you all. Um, can, I, can I just interject there? So were we. We must have been different age groups. Swansea, Swansea were the world champions, two years on the trot when I was, uh, you know, but, you know, I, let's, yeah, let's leave it at that. <laughs> You're a bit older than me, though, mate, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a bit older. I'm a bit older. <laughs> uh, I also played for, like, North East Wales, as it was, Cluid, um, back in the day. Um, we were also champions of Wales at that point. Um, and I played under-18s uh, Welsh football as well. Uh, which was a pretty good experience. I played for British colleges as well. And uh, I was a schoolboy footballer with uh, Wrexham Football Club first and foremost, back in the day when Brian Flynn was the manager. And then I signed schoolboy forms for Everton um, and played for Everton with the legendary ne Neville Southall, mate, as the, the main goalkeeper. So that's how long ago it was. But um, I... A bit, really failed as a footballer mate and um, it's not so good if you can't catch crosses so um, that was my biggest shortcoming as a goalkeeper so um, yeah I got I got released and got let go um, ended up playing semi-pro football I played for real in the League of Wales and stuff like that but um, yeah I never made it to the top end of the game so um, physically I think I was going to the gym this is my story mate <laughs> and yeah. Um, I went to the gym literally when I was 12 years old because uh, Mel Pedrick was the physio at Wrexham and I had Osgood Slatter's uh, syndrome, which is a t tendon issue. Uh, when you grow really quickly when you're a kid and you get tall, um, your tendons tend to have a slower rate of growth. Yeah. So you just get um, pain and inflammation. So Mel started working with him, he was a really good physio, and he said, Nick, you need to go to the gym to get physically stronger and to be able to, like, you know, withstand what your body is doing as you're getting older. So I went, great, how do I go to the gym? So he went, well, just go down and Joey Jones, I'm sure you remember, mate, was a bit of a legend. Yeah. In Wrexham. Joey has the, the academy boys and the first team boys in the gym, so just go to the gym. So off I went to the gym. Um, I'd go in in half terms as well and train with the first team when I was at Wrexham at that age. And I literally just copied what everyone else was doing. Yeah. And then when I left Wrexham and went to Everton, um, we, we used to like go into the gym and Duncan Ferguson would be in the gym. And Big Dunk could be like, we're doing bicep curls today, lads. So everyone would do bicep curls, of course, because Big Dunk was the legend. And um, we just used to literally copy what those guys did. Um, after, I, after I sort of failed I, uh, as a footballer, I went to university 
and I went to America traveling as well. And that was the first time I heard the term strength and conditioning coach or physical preparation specialist, if you like. And um, that's when I thought, Do you know what? Perhaps I would have been a professional goalkeeper now if I'd have had somebody looking after my physical development instead of me just going and training randomly and doing what other people were doing and just having a bit of a go at stuff. If I'd have had someone who'd helped me develop my weaknesses and maximize my strengths, um, I think, you know, I'd, I'd have definitely stood a better chance of making it and being able to jump higher and catch them crosses, mainly. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's something we touched on before we started the call, wasn't it? With, you know, someone I've been following over the last few years, and uh, he was, of course, uh, Gary Speed's assistant manager with Wales, uh, the Dutchman, Raymond Verhalen. And, you know, it'd just be interested to get your thoughts on it, because what, what Raymond talks about is that for young players, which is where my main interest is for, you know, the people listen, listening and watching this call, they are, you know, there's a lot of players out there looking to make their way in the game, as we were. Yeah. Uh, you know, definitely for me, physical development held me back, or a lack of physical development, optimum physical development held me back. And yet Raymond, who's, who's a, a conditioning specialist, if you like, in, this, in, in at, you know, at the top level of the game, he would recommend, or he does recommend that, you know, it's, if you're training three days a week, it should all be football. You know, it should be with the ball, it should be playing the game, and you don't really need to be doing any specialist work. Now, although I follow a lot of what Raymond says and I agree with it, that doesn't quite resonate with me because I know for me there was definitely some things that needed correcting. Um, but where, where do you stand on it? You're the, you know, a lot more qualified than me to, to answer it. Yeah, mate, I think it, it's a good, like, it's a good question that you pose. Um, I think football has got caught in a little bit of a trap, if I'm honest. Um, I work in other sports, so I work, I've worked extensively for the Welsh Rugby Union. I've worked for the English Rugby Union as well. Um, I've worked in water polo, British swimming, um, England lacrosse, England netball, um, and countless different snow sport athletes. And all these other Olympic sports and professional sports right, really invest with their kids time and effort to develop physic, physical aspects alongside of the technical and tactical aspects of the game. Yeah. But there are specific periods where the players, male or female, will come out of the sport and, and really have a focus on physical development. Mm. Uh, in football, it, it's just not happening, mate. So um, one, of, one of our coaches he used to be a, um, an athlete of mine. He signed pro for Wrexham, and then he, was, he played in the, in the League of Wales for rarely currently plays uh, for Ballard Town. His name's Connell Murta. Um, Connell is, works for Liverpool's Academy and um, he, he's there on the full-time staff looking after the boys in the academy group. And one of the big things, I go in and just chat with Connell quite regularly and the, and the coach is there. One of the big things is getting time for the players to develop physical aspects to, to push on. Okay. So a, a typical sort of like pl player's career by the time they're about 14, they're, they're really performing, they're really doing well, they're being looked at as potential for academies uh, up and down the country. And then they go into this academy, if they haven't already been in it from a really young age. Uh, but let's just start around 14. And then it's all about performance. So they have to perform to get onto a full-time academy programme when they're 16. Then once they're 16, 17, 18, 19, they're trying to get into the 21 squad and trying to peak for games for the 20, 21s and the under-18s. And that window, players are totally missing physical development out in professional football. And what's happening then is if they're good enough, like let's just take uh, Sterling, he gets into the first team and then it's all about performance of getting out on the pitch and delivering the goods. So he's, he hasn't had that 
pathway of a time where he's consistently had a period to develop physically. Now, there'll be one or two players like Sterling who come through that system, who've got the natural physical attributes to excel, but there'll not be a raft of people underneath who, having a consistent period of developing physically, mm. be able to make their game have quantum leaps and, and really push forward. And yeah. I think that's what we're missing out, mate. Absolutely. And it's, it's not just in a physical dimension either, either, is it? You know, it's in every aspect of development. I agree with you. The, the focus is on performance. It's about results. So kids can't develop as well as they might technically, tactically, you know, psychologically. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to ask you then is, you know, it's interesting you mentioned 14 years old as, as being as the, the time when things start to get uh, serious, if you like, in academy levels. What would you say, you know, the, the, there might be parents watching this who have kids from as young as four, six years old, where we start with our players, right up to 18 and, and beyond. So what are the, can you give us, from your perspective, your experience, and the research uh, and, and clinical experience you have of the priorities at each stage of development from a physical point of view for a footballer who wants to fulfil his potential? Yeah, good, mate. Well, in every single age group across the board, right the way up to a senior player, to an under four player, speed is king. So if you can help um, your football player to become faster in any way, shape or form, then that should be the priority in my opinion. Um, the ability then to change direction in football specific ways um, and people call it agility, quite rightly, as like being able to go from going in a straight line to a cut and beat someone, get around the outside. If you think of a defensive situation, I was watching United and, and Leicester in the, on the weekend and the corner that Schweinsteiger got in, that, that contact situation, the evasion, the, the getting round someone or in Schweinsteiger's case, just running straight through him. And to, to create an opportunity, that, that's key for the game. So I think speed and agility are the two key components. Maybe. Okay, good. Um, so sort of it, dynamic movement, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Where, it, where, where would you stand on, you know, we've, we've had some great physical development coaches come in. James Prosser is one. He's a guy who was uh, working a lot with the Ospreys with their, within their academy. And he, he, his philosophy, which, which did resonate with me, was, you know, at the young ages, it's all about exploring fundamental movement patterns. And it's about not necessarily being technically perfect with their, you know, learning how to squat and that sort of stuff. But it's learning to handle their own body weight, you know, monkey walks and bear crawls and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Where, where would you stand with that? Defo, mate. So yeah. the earlier you start doing stuff, the better. Yeah. The the basic fundamentals are: can you use your body weight and control your own body weight in multiple directions in multiple planes? And at the young ages, mate, it looks nothing at all like what's going to go on on a football pitch. Like you, it just doesn't even look like it. So you're never really going to start crawling around on a football pitch. Unless things have gone very wrong for you, but that's teaching you to control your own body weight. People talk about core stability a lot, and that's a fundamental component to be able to crawl is having good core stability. Can you can you explain why that's so fundamental? The core stability. Core stability. Yeah, it's the ability to transfer force through your body. That's how I look at it, and um, stabilize your body in different planes. So. You, you might have a, a situation where you want to run fast and your legs start going, but every time you apply force to the floor, the, it gets lost and, gets, um, and disappears through your trunk and midsection. Mm. Um, your arm action counts for about 30 to 35% of how fast you can run. So you're trying to generate force with your arms, yeah. with your legs, 
and it all gets lost in the middle. In okay. the so you end up going over very fast. Okay. So that's at the youngest. So so if you were if you were to break it down into phases, what would what would be the sort of age brackets you would focus on and and the different stages? Would it be four to six, seven to eleven, or how would you approach it? And what would be the priorities? Yeah. So the earlier you can get people, the better. Yeah. The later you get them, do you still probably have to start at the fundamentals? So you can never start too young. You can never start too young, mate. Definitely, that's a good message to put yeah. out to the listeners. Yeah, and and I, you know, this is something that I find is a lot of parents. You know, some people say to me, Frank, you must deal with a lot of pushy parents, and you know, I have, of course, <laughs> but it's it's actually the other way around. Most parents. I don't know whether it's a Welsh thing. I don't know what it is, but most parents are more at pains to emphasize that they, they, they don't expect their son's going to be a superstar. They don't want to push him, you know, and, and that kind of thing, you know, and they, they're almost afraid to, 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 to start something as, you know, in case they're perceived to be in too serious about it. Yeah. So, so my philosophy is, you know, whether they're playing football or whether they're doing fundamental movement patterns, it's, it has to be inherently enjoyable, you know? And, and, and very often, the exercise that they're, they're doing, they don't even realize that, oh yeah, I'm developing my core strength. You know, a four-year-old's not gonna understand that. A six-year-old, even an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old might start to put a label on it, but, you know, where, where would you stand on that? Yeah, definitely, mate. So, just making things fun, even when you have, like senior players who are full-time professionals. Um, it's not about entertaining them, but it's making the environment really enjoyable. So they go, do you know what? I really want to get in there and I really want to work and I want to improve, you know. Simple things like I work with a load of England golfers and they play golf um, uh, for England seniorly. And yeah. The girls are in last night and what music are you having on girls? And they're dancing in the gym, like utter... Like nut, nuts if anybody looked at us and seen what the hell we're doing, but they're dancing as part of their warm up during the session, um, and they're doing the work, but they're just yeah. having great fun at the same time. So yeah, fun's key. Okay. But going back to your question, mate, around around about that age where you physically get bigger, so it's called peak height velocity, and. Um, Parents who've got kids around 11, 12, 13 will know what I'm on about. Their their little Johnny's just gone from being four foot nothing to six foot two in in like the space of a year. And that is the big window, really. So if we take it before that window, in an ideal world, this person would have all the fundamental movement patterns already laid down. Mm. developed good speed mechanics yeah working when, can you go through some of the fundamental movement patterns that we're talking about just just yeah. for everyone that's listening and watching squat lunge pu- do a push a pull a twist so those are the the mon- fundamental movements. so they would need those in place the you know the the correct technique before they start the main growth spurt yeah, as, as often, so you've laid down that motor pattern. It's, it's in their head. They can call yeah. upon it. You can go, do, can you do a squat for me? And they can just do it. Um, and that, that's, that's where you want them at that age. Also, in running mechanics, they've got good running mechanics. So people think, oh, you naturally can run fast or, or you, you, you can't, but it's a, t- it's a skill. It's a taught skill. So... You have to learn where to put your foot, how to move your limb. That's why track sprinters spend ages practicing how to run in a straight line because they're trying to refine that movement pattern. Yeah. So ideally, you have that and have worked on that before you hit this stage of growth. Now, this might happen at different ages. Um, so for myself, Frank, I was a goalkeeper, as I told you, and I've got a picture of me in the last year of primary school, um, I was taller than the, t- the teachers who were coaching the team on the school picture, and all my peers were, weren't even up to my shoulder. So I was probably about five foot 10 when I was 11. 
So I'd experienced that very early. Mm. And then other players, other, other peers of mine, other lads who played in the team, by the time they were 13, 14, were just had kicked into that big growth spurt. By the time I was in my last year of school, I was six foot one, and other pe- lots of other people had caught up with me, and some of the players had overtook me, so they were like six foot four. And I was no longer the busy- biggest in the team in terms of height. I was uh, you know, still tall, but not massive. Mm. So that can happen at different ages, but once that's kicked in, or during that time as well, there's a period where the individual just gets totally, utterly mm. uncontrolled in their movements. So they look like Bambi on ice. They'll be falling over their shoelaces. They'll be trying to head a ball and it looks like they're not getting off the ground. Mm. They might be taking a throw in and like drop the ball in front of them. They just lose coordination yeah. of things that they go, did before. And I suppose the biggest message there, mate, is... Everyone thinks, oh, my son used to be good at football and now he's rubbish. Yeah. But that's not the case. Yeah. So during that time, we still focus on the fundamentals, strip it back down, make everything really simple, really, really simple. And then uh, overnight, they'll just click and change and you'll see them go, oh, they're starting to move better. Oh, look, look at that. They're jumping better. Mm. you've got to watch for it but you'll see it change yeah and then at that so, point you can so simple with the the control of the ball you know I always remember when I was playing I knew that when I was in a good state and my coordination was there because I'd be thinking what am I going to do with the ball when I get it I'm not thinking how am I going to get the ball under control and this the simplest you know the simplest technique could desert you can it yeah for sure man and certainly I can remember that when I was when I was going through that sort of growth phase. Mm. And then once they've gone through that and they've come out the other end, you've reinforced the movement patterns, they've got the movement pattern yeah. back, then you can start adding a bit of external load. So that might be a bungee cord, that might be a, a band around the knees, it might be a medicine ball, it might be a wooden pole um, to, to start overloading their movement patterns. Yeah. Then as they progress a little bit older, by the time they're 14, 15, 16, they've got a real window then of starting to develop strength, which will then translate into them being able to run faster and being able to hold off players when they're being, like, you know, in a contact situation and, you know, being able better to shield the ball and fend off players. And obviously the, the wrestle situation in, in the area as well, which is now a part of the game. And that might be where they start going to the gym and start using like um, dumbbells and uh, kettlebells and stuff like that to add more load because they're already very good at doing the other things. So that's around about the age of 15, 16, assuming they, they've hit that stage of growth and development. I mean, we've got a player who's... 15 this year yeah. and he still hasn't hit his his growth phase if you like um, so he would be advised to stay out of the gym yeah I'd say you're yeah. just holding back off him you just yeah. I'm waiting I'm waiting and waiting to see when when this all kicks off in terms of movement patterns go wrong he grows quite a bit and then you're away to go yeah um, Let's assume they've gone through that period then, just around 14, 15, 16 years old. I tend to back off a little bit um, for like six, six, eight months with, with athletes I work with then, go and work on other stuff, and then come back into developing strength, power, and speed um, at, well, before they're like, you know, 19, 20. And that, that really sets them apart. Yeah. With rugby players that I've done it with, they for for the future, they're physically better than all their peers. So at every age group. So I worked in North Wales for the Welsh Rugby Union, and what James King um, plays for the Welsh national side plays for the Ospreys. Um, I did that exact same thing with Kingy, and it physically. He's that much better than everyone else at his age group. 
Um, the other big player would be George North. Yeah. So George was playing international rugby when he was 19. He was exposed to a physical development program in North Wales. And if he hadn't have been exposed to that when he was 12, 13, 14, 15, he wouldn't have been playing international rugby when he was 19. Nowhere. Mm. So it's about taking the, the chances of uh, uh, windows of optimal training to, to maximise them for, for their careers. So it was the North Wales programme that deserves the credit for him picking up that Aussie guy and running halfway down the field? <laughs> Most definitely, <laughs> mate, yeah. So, um, I started my coaching career in North Wales, mate, and um, the, they didn't have any strength and conditioning set up whatsoever. And yeah. I started working with a small group of players. Lots of them went on to be international rugby players at different yeah. groups and seniors. And then we expanded it, made, made it bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's different sites across North Wales. Yeah. And uh, now they've got the RGC Academy, uh, Rugby Gogleth Cymru, right. uh, which I helped set up as well, which just now churns out players who yeah. are age group rugby players for, for, uh, for Wales as well. So. Okay. So let's bring it back to football for us then, if we can. Where do players and parents who want to support their kids, because those are the people who are watching and listening, you know, aspiring players, players who want to get better, they want to get to a higher level. What are kind of the wrong turns or the mistakes or the, the, the pitfalls around them that prevent players from a physical development point of view? What, you know, what stops them moving forward? Because we've already said virtually nobody outside the pro clubs, uh, uh, you know, is, nobody's doing physical development to the level that they need to be doing. So, so what, what would you say? So I think it's an education um, gap, really, but football's behind other sports in that respect. So other sports know that they've got to do physical training to get better on the pitch. And um, football, I call it the George Best syndrome, mate. And um, George Best is quite rightly renowned as one of the best players ever, but he's also renowned for going out drinking, partying and doing everything else that went with his lifestyle. Turning up, doing a little bit of training um, and then just getting on a pitch on a Saturday and being one of the best players ever. And in football, there's, there's that apathy where you're doing extras mm. if you're trying to physically develop yeah. and enhance yourself. And it's it's almost frowned upon, mate. That yeah. they you would say even now, still in the game, that is that is still a big issue. Definitely. You know, I I, heard, I I talked to a guy who was uh, for at one time a, a conditioning coach at Swansea, and he said every every Friday, one of the players would be doing bench presses, and and the coach said, to him, "Why are you doing bench presses?" And he said, "Well, I'm not starting tomorrow. I'm out. To, I'm out on a Friday night." <laughs> You know, but that was, that was a few years ago now. Um, so definitely, there's there's that culture of it's interesting. If you read George Best's autobiography, I forget. I, I, you know, I read it when I was growing up as a kid. Up until the age of about well, his early twenties, before he just you know became an absolute superstar, he did have a real work ethic and yeah. he loved practicing. He really loved practicing, and if you look at the way he developed as a footballer, he just played street football, you know, day in, day out, all, all hours of the day in Belfast. So, you know, it's like, the, it goes back to that quote, doesn't it, from Bobby Charlton. He said, the World Cup in 1966 wasn't won at Wembley, it's won on the streets. Oh. You know, and I, I believe that we still haven't, number one, replaced the street soccer you know, of everybody playing like down in Swansea, it was down on the beach. You know, if you look at some of the top top players ever to come out to Swansea and Wales, you're looking at Cliff Moore, um, sorry, Cliffy Jones, you know, double winner with Spurs, quarter finalist with Wales. Um, you're looking at uh, Terry Medwin. Both of those played on the beach in Swansea, endless hours. You know, that's why we started the Swansea Beach Soccer Festival uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Then the other side of it is, even if all that was still going on and we had that culture of kids playing and playing and playing and playing and playing, 
the game has just accelerated away from from Britain, you know, the, the UK. Uh, you know, and it was going back as far as the 50s with the Hungarians and, you know, um, all, you know, the major new European nations then coming through, Italy, uh, Spain, France and so on, yeah. as well as the South Americans. And, you know, even in Brazil, uh, I don't know how much you, you've got into the Brazilian philosophy, but certainly the, the stuff that I've got into is it's, it's very much... A misconception is that it's all sort of it's all beach football and it's all you know dancing and, and whatever they're very much into physical development yeah. and uh it's something that we just we just haven't caught up on we just you know like like you say it's a, it's a massive cultural thing yeah. so one of the questions i had is if a player finds himself you know for example i find that players get into say swansea schoolboys and they might be with a development center. You know, they're, they're in that bracket of players who are trying to get somewhere. They're not quite at an academy. They want to get into a, a you know, have a good opportunity. And, and I agree with you 100%. The opportunity to get into a pro academy is around about 14. That's the best time. And, um, but they aren't necessarily getting the quality and quantity of training. You know, for example, schoolboys representative sides sometimes only train once a fortnight. And even then, it might only, you know, it might be called off. Yeah. Um, they might be playing for five different teams. They might be playing local club, school, county or city schoolboys. They might be playing um, Welsh League Academy. But in all of those sessions, they aren't getting their physical development. So straight away, you can see, well, there's too much going on. It's too, you know, when they are getting a lot of football, it's, it's, a lot of quantity, not enough quality. Yeah. Well, what would you say to a, a player who wants to improve his physical development in between sessions because he's not getting it at his club or, or whatever else? Yeah. Well, you've got to be proactive, mate. So um, the parents, the, the player themselves, have got to take it upon themselves and go and find a qualified strength and conditioning coach mm. to work with. Um, we, I'd love to work with everyone in Swansea, mate, but <laughs> it's it, ge geographically impossible yeah. for the guys to come and see me in Manchester. But yeah. there are other strength coaches who yeah. were qualified, and the best place to find them would be on the UK Strength and Conditioning Association website. Okay. And Good. There's a tool that they can use to search yeah. by postcode on the front page. That's so, right. If they type in UKSCA, yeah, you can search for coaches in the Swansea area. Brilliant. Um, there's more and more coaches like myself who are who are putting on programs. So we have about six footballers who are some f four of them off the top of the head are in uh, professional football club academies, and then two of them aren't, and they come and train with us. Uh, because their parents have found us and they like, we want the best for our son. So we want them to come and train with you. Mm -hmm. Some of them, depending if they've got a midweek game, will come and train three times a week with us. And um, they, you can see how they just move on exponentially in the game. And the feedback that the parents give us is that compared to the other players in that age group, they just are jumping forward leaps and bounds. So um, I can't emphasize enough, get a good coach, find that coach, and then go and work with him regularly. Okay, brilliant. So what sort of results, you know, you're talking about taking giant leaps forward. What practical differences can players expect to see in their performance as a result of a quality strength and conditioning and, you know, physical development program? So the first thing that I always focus on is that that first step. So the ability to, to get away from an opponent or get to an opponent. So people just look at it and they go, oh, they're slow on the pitch. They're not moving well. They're, they're, they're a yard off the pace. These are the terms that like people say when they see it. Yeah. And working with a, 
with a coach, uh, S&C coach, that, that can be eradicated. So your, your son or, or, or daughter, for that matter, will just be that step ahead of the player, the op- opponent. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to see things when the game's unfolding, but then they'll be able, able to physically do something about it. So mm. they'll be able to, to get in and make a block. They'll be able to get up for that header and clear the ball or score the goal. They'll be physically able to do these tasks, which they can see and they know they want to do, but their body's not letting them at the moment. Mm. What about injury prevention? What, what, how does your experience and research come into it with regards to young players? You know, we see it now. Players even as young as 10, picking up hamstring injuries, groin injuries. Um, so h- how does a programme that uh, the type of coach or the type of programme that you could offer how would that help with injury prevention yeah so the first one is if I could prevent injuries um, Sir Alex Ferguson would have brought me onto the staff years ago and I'd be at, at Carrington now looking after everyone at Man United because I am a Man United fan mate I love them to bits, season ticket older, and like I'd work for Man United any day of the week. Yeah. Uh, if I could prevent injuries, that would be the club I'd work for me. But unfortunately, I can't prevent injuries, and nobody can prevent injuries. Okay. So there's two ways of looking at it do less and expose players to re- less risk, and then there'll be a decrease in injuries or train them properly and iron out the imbalances, make the body work optimally as it should do, and then there's a decreased chance of getting injured. So Brendan Rodgers at Liverpool was was known to not let the players run over um, seven metres per second in a week, in a training week, and they use GPS to track how fast they're running. And... That by doing that, they didn't have hamstring injuries in games as much. But then when they had two games in a week, they had lots of injuries because the players weren't used to having that amount of exposure running over seven metres per second in a game. Yeah. So you're sort of almost setting yourself up to fail. Um, another interesting one is when Van Gaal came to United, he had a spate of injuries, if you remember, and that's because his, phys- his training is physically more demanding than what the United players were used to. So he stepped it up. He had a period of lots of injuries, and now the injuries have subsided and disappeared because the players are, are better conditioned to be able to do that. So it comes down to conditioning? comes down yeah, to exposure yeah. of the demands of the game and how often... Too much definitely will tip you over the edge, but not enough will still tip you over the edge when you're exposed to a greater demand. Okay, and, that, and I suppose that's exactly where a, a physical development coach can come in and say, look at any player, their timetable through the week, what's going on in school, what's going on after school, you know, throughout the week, what's going on on the weekends, and be able to advise on where and when players need to rest. Uh, you know, to be able to recover properly in between games, yeah, and do, and do more, and take take like you know a, a block of yes, we're going to do more at this period of time to because we need to expose to that. So. Okay, fantastic. All right, thanks very much, Nick. My pleasure, mate. How can uh, anyone listening and watching? How can they get hold of you or uh, find out more about you? So, read- my website, mate, is uh, www.ena-sports-performance.com. And uh, there's lovely videos of there on me, me talking, mate, so you'll be able to find some good information about what we do. Okay, so give, give us that again next. It's www.dna-sports. Sports hyphen performance hyphen performance dot com dot com great stuff 
thank you very much, Nick. So maybe not. one day we'll get you down to Swansea to work with our players. I'll look forward to it, mate. Great stuff.